In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings to all my brothers and sisters out there there in Christ on this 25th day of the month of July in the year of our Lord 2020. I would like to talk in this episode, this segment of Learning to Live in God's Divine Will, on the distinction between spiritual marriage and living in the Divine Will. People often ask, is the gift that God imparted to the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, different than the gift that the great mystical doctors of the Church enjoyed, namely Catherine of Siena, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and others? Now bear in mind that Jesus tells Louisa that the gift of living in the divine will is a newly actualized gift that no other saint before her received that was conceived in sin. Also bear in mind that Dionysius the Areopagite and St. John of the Cross related that there's growth ongoing, unending growth, even in the highest state of union with God. For example, in his work on Orthodox spirituality, Dionysius the Areopagite states that the angels, even in heaven, progress in an unending way in the knowledge of God's truth. And John of the Cross adds regarding the angels that their spirit is ever being filled by the object of their desire without the disgust of being satiated. Now this comes from the living flame of love, stanza 3, verse 23. What John of the Cross here means is that the angelic desire is always being nurtured by infusion from God. They never arrive at a point in which they can say, that's it, I finally obtained the point of obtaining all of God, and I am fully satiated. They never arrive at that point because the soul of rational beings is created ontologically by God in such a way that it is filling this propensity God had put in it for all eternity. You see, God is eternal, and a finite creature with a rational soul can never fully contain him. Therefore, it is continuously containing more and more of him throughout eternity. Now, this suggests that there is an infinite capacity for growth in God among rational beings, even in heaven, when the saints, for example, the angels, are satisfied with the clear vision of his essence, known as the beatific vision. On earth, we enjoy not the beatific vision, which removes Im- which removes passibility and peccability, but with the intuitive vision, which does not remove these two. We can still sin on earth. We can still suffer on earth. 
So while describing the growth of the soul on earth, John of the Cross follows the traditional schema of a three-stage process that we are familiar with, namely purification, illumination, and unification. What are these three stages? They're found in the writings of Catherine of Siena, St. Francis de Sales, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and other mystics and saints. All of which are today are doctors, saints in the church. Purification is the purging of the appetites of the body and of the soul the flesh and the spirit. God progressively purifies, purges, cleanses of their inordinate desires to the things of the earth, whether they are food, money, property, creature comforts in human beings, clothing, sense of security that is in intellectual reassurance that is inordinate. Not that that's bad in and of itself, it's not. But if it's in excess, it's inordinate. So all of these attachments and more to the intellect, to the memory, to the will, these clingings, these trappings, in and of themselves, they're okay. But it's the excessiveness that makes them inordinate. And of that... God purifies us. And this purification happens in every single human being ever conceived. Everyone. Now, Mary and Jesus were conceived without sin. And they didn't need this purification because everything they did was ordinate. It was not inordinate. They never sinned. They never went beyond the happy means of moderation, in which consists virtue. The Latinists, as many people know, had a famous expression of attaining perfection in the virtues, and that was, in media virtus est. Virtue consists in moderation. Now, there's one virtue that is not subject to moderation. All the others are. And that one virtue that is not subject to moderation is love. And it's manifest in martyrdom. Martyrdom is an excessive love, and that's a virtue only with love. Every other virtue must be regulated by moderation. Now, purification, as I mentioned, impacts the body and the soul, the flesh and the spirit. And it happens in everyone's life from the moment they are born. Where does it begin, more specifically? Well, when the doctor holds you by your feet upside down and smacks you low enough and hard enough that you realize you've left the comfort of your mother's womb. That's the beginning of purification in the the natal sense of the word. But it's indeliberate. It becomes deliberate when we attain the age of reason and we consent. We do not kick against the goad, so to speak, but we consent to this dynamic, graceful operation of God in us, in which he's he's purging us from inordinate attachments. For example, I'm at the age of 12 and... I wanted for Christmas, I don't know, um, a baseball glove, or a soccer ball, or a basketball, or a game, and it didn't come. I can hold my breath, stamp my feet, and pout or scream, or I can simply say, well, Lord, I offer this up. Now, that's consenting to purification, see? Because when we're young, we're all leaning inordinately to one thing or another. Why? Not because we're bad people, but because we have the law of sin in us from 
conception. We're born with original sin. And as the Council of Trent teaches, along with the Baltimore Catechism, which is its catechism, which has been perfected in the most recent catechism, even after baptism, the inclination to sin remains in all the baptized. That means we're leaning towards excessiveness in our attractions to the things around us. Everyone does. So God will purify us in the early stages of our growth toward perfection in him, toward union with that divine will. And after the purification comes the illumination. Now, when I speak of, or when John of the Cross speaks of purification, illumination, and unification, he doesn't mean that once purification ends, at that moment, illumination begins. No, no, no. They overlap. Rather, what he's saying is that the emphasis of these three stages is in the first stage on purification. The emphasis of these three stages, all of which overlap, in the second stage is on illumination. And the third stage is unification. The emphasis is on unification. So even though the soul has been purged sufficiently enough, it now begins to become illuminated in the ways in which God operates in our lives through tragedies, through fortunes and misfortunes, through consolations and desolations, through the events in our lives, through people that God puts in our lives, through the Word of God. through the sacraments, through sermons, through councils. God operates in us in various ways, but we don't begin to understand this until we are sufficiently purged. Remember, the cross is the greatest source of wisdom. These are the words of St. Bonaventure. St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a contemporary of Bonaventure, was walking by with a Dominican, and he saw Bonaventure in his cell writing, and he said, let us not disturb one saint who's writing on the life of another saint. Bonaventure was writing the biography of the life of a saint, you see. And by the way, many people don't realize this, but the conclave, the election of a pope, began with Bonaventure. Now, the the, the uh, consistory of cardinals was taking too long to decide on a pope. It was going on for months and months and months and years. <laughs> and Bonaventure said, let's lock them in there and let, not let them out without food or drink until they vote. And that's why they call it conclave, which means with a key in Latin. So they kept them in there without, you know, they kept the key. They locked them in there. Anyway, this purification overlaps illumination. And when the soul is sufficiently purged through the cross, it becomes illuminated. And the reason I brought up Bonaventure and Aquinas is because the seat of wisdom is the cross. When Aquinas asked Bonaventure, where did you get all this wisdom? Bonaventure pointed to the crucifix and said, there. Imagine that Aquinas asking Bonaventure where he got his wisdom. We think Aquinas has the most... Mm. You know, intellectual, scholastic theologian in the history of Western theology. And he probably is. But he looked up to Bonaventure as that. So purification, the cross, infuses in us tremendous knowledge. And the cross, Jesus tells Louisa, is a tremendous sacrament because it disposes us to receive the other sacraments. He tells her in March, in, in volume 5, on March 16th, 1904, the cross is the most precious and the noblest gift that is given by the greatest and most unique person that exists. It is more pleasing and brings more rejoicing and more gladness than all other gifts. The soul comes to experience the effects of the cross 
when it is perfectly resigned to my will and has given itself entirely to me without holding anything back, and so as not to be surpassed in love by the soul, I give myself entirely to the soul, and in so doing, I also give to it my cross. And the soul, recognizing it as my gift, rejoices and is glad. People one will ask, well, what is the cross? You know, we use that symbolically. What exactly does it mean? Is it a physical cross? The cross in this context, and whenever Jesus uses it 99% of the time, it refers to all the misfortunes or inconveniences or difficulties we experience in life that God permits, whether at the hand of Satan or at the hand of God. We can offer them up regardless where they come from, and God can use them as redemptive and salvific merits for the salvation and conversion of other souls. So purification disposes us to understand how God works in our lives in many ways, and this illumination lends itself to unification. The more we know of God, Thomas Aquinas wrote, the more we can love him. And loving unites us with the beloved, the creator the spouse, the bridegroom. We cannot love someone whose desires we do not know. Imagine you trying to court someone in a engagement, but you don't know that person's likes or dislikes. Well, it won't go very far in the courtship because love seeks to please the beloved according to the beloved's desires. So you make it your concern, your effort, your priority to know what the beloved likes, to meet the beloved's expectations and likes, to establish an espousalship, a nuptial relationship. Well, that's why illumination lends to unification. We have to know in order to love and be united with the beloved. And John of the Cross speaks of these three stages purification, illumination, and unification as the tripartition of uh, the road leading along the path of spiritual marriage. St. Teresa of Avila speaks of these stages in seven mansions. The first four mansions occupy purification. The next two mansions occupy the stage of illumination. And the last seventh stage, a castle, occupies the stage of unification. That's spiritual marriage, which is preceded by the sixth mansion, which is spiritual betrothal. In his Song of Songs, John speaks of these stages. He mentions purification, illumination, unification, also spiritual betrothal and spiritual marriage. The soul's knowledge, wisdom, understanding of God, as well as its union with him, are the fruit of purification, which John dedicates a whole book to, entitled The Dark Night of the Soul. During this time, the soul is being weaned, from its inordinate attachments to things of this world, to such a point that its memory, intellect, and will are in darkness, obscurity. That is, they don't understand what is happening around them. They're in complete ignorance, so to speak, to God's divine designs. John gives a beautiful analogy to this, and we all go through this when we're entering into the divine will. We're going necessarily through this purification. The analogy is a room that is dark in which you are sitting with a window through which sunbeams enter. And in those sunbeams, you see the dust particles in the room that until the sunbeams entered, you were unable to see, but that were always there. 
Similarly, when God's divine, uncreated light penetrates our souls who seek to live in the divine will, we see all the dust that was always there but had not yet been revealed to us. And when that divine light penetrates our soul, it reveals the dark particles in its light. And we are made aware of this. And this leads to, at times, oppression, depression, melancholy. And the devil can enter into that sentiment and make us despair. But God gives us the grace to avoid that if we are docile to accept that. And this subsequently is just a pale reflection of cases of suicide where the person's actions are mitigated. Saint Jean Vianney, the curate of ours, was once approached by a mother whose son jumped from a bridge and killed himself. He was in despair. And his mother was in the throes of despair, and that's why she approached this holy French priest and said to him, What can I do? My son is in hell. The church teaches that all people who commit suicide are damned. And he told her that he would pray. And when he saw her again, he told her that it was revealed to him that from the moment he jumped from the bridge to the moment he died, he converted. How is this possible, you may think? Sometimes the crosses and trials and traumas in life are so intense that in this darkness, our intellects and memories do not understand why this is happening. And this is an occasion for the devil to whisper into our ear, it's useless, your life is useless, forget about hope. And some people, not docile enough to the grace of the Holy Spirit in that moment, will listen to the devil and follow his advice. But God sees these extenuating circumstances that caused that person to take their life, if they go so far to do that. Or if not so far as to take their life, to not fight with courage against this evil voice, because their intellects and memories are impaired with darkness, this obscurity that John of the Cross addresses in his work, The Dark Night of the Soul. So therefore, we, do, we can't sit in the seat of judgment like God and say, oh, that person is in hell, that person's in purgatory. We don't know these things. Only God knows the situation in which that person acted that led to their decisions and what mitigating, if any, circumstances impacted that decision. Now, John of the Cross says the intensity and length of this dark night, this purification, is determined by the state of holiness to which God calls each individual differently. Or, I should say, not the state, but the degree of holiness to which God calls each individual separately and differently. We are not all called to the same degree of holiness. But we are all called to be filled with God in different degrees. As the little flower put it, she's a little glass filled to the brim, but her founder, St. Teresa of Avila, is a big glass filled to the brim, but they're both filled to the brim with God, but in different degrees of holiness. St. Paulinus emphasizes this soul's ongoing growth in God, just like the angels and saints in heaven, which is endless, when he said, Finitum capax retinendi infinitum. That's a Latin expression meaning the finite soul is capable of containing the infinite God who created it. But we contain him not all at the same time, but progressively, unendingly, in degrees, even in heaven. For this reason, John of the Cross affirms that even the soul reaches union in this life with God 
it always exclaims, where are you hidden? And I'm quoting from his work, the spiritual canticle stanza 1 verse 11. Even though the soul reaches union in this life, the highest, highest state attainable here below, the soul always exclaims, where are you hidden? For even this state of union, God is still hidden from the soul in the bosom of the Father. Unquote. This signifies that even in the state of spiritual marriage, the soul is capable of growing in deeper union with God. This is the platform for the union that emerges from the gift of living in the divine will that God would actualize in Louisa. Now, the theologian, Father Thomas Dubay, who passed away just a few years ago, in his wonderful work, The Transforming Summit, states that John of the Cross affirms just as one jewel differs from another, so also do those as the contemplative summit varies. Even in the same stage of growth, the Lord does not give everyone everything to everyone. To some he gives more, to others less. To some in one way, to others in another. Therefore, even in the seventh mansions, spiritual marriage, one star differs from another in glory. We never reach a point on earth where we can say enough. Unquote. This is from page 195 in his work, the fire within the transform on the chapter the transforming summit let's take a pause here at this midway point before going into the gift of living in the divine will and comparing it with spiritual marriage radio maria depends upon your support prayerful and financial in this commercial free 100% listener supported broadcast that brings you to your doorstep, with or without the COVID-19, the truths contained in scripture, tradition, magisterial teaching, on the greatest gift God can impart to the human race, namely, that of living in his divine will. Now, in my doctoral dissertation, for those of you who have it, if you go to pages 75 to 78, you will find this comparison in scholastic language, patristic language, but that it will break down in simple terms for you here between spiritual marriage and the gift of living in God's divine will. Remember, Jesus ushered in the fiat of redemption before the fiats of sanctification. I'm sorry. And after the fiat of creation. But after redemption came the fiat of sanctification. When a soul is baptized, it begins the growth toward sanctification. And in order to help dispose souls to retain the state of sanctification or unceasing prayer, the soul must go through these stages of purification, illumination, and unification. There is a beautiful passage by Hannibal di Francia that illustrates this. And I'm going to pull it up for you. And this comes from letter number three to Louisa, dated August 30th, 1926. Hannibal, of course, in this letter refers to himself as Louisa's spiritual director with a small s. Jesus is her, or the Holy Spirit is her spiritual director with a capital S. And he says, I insist on this point, that is, that sanctity does not consist of a formula. In order to form with this new knowledge of living in the divine will saints who may surpass those of the past, the new saints must 
have all the virtues and in heroic degree of the saints of old. Think of that. That means that for us to live completely in God's divine will, and that's the key adjective, completely, we must go through these three stages of purification, illumination, and unification. However, we can still live in God's will without having gone through these three stages effectively. Remember, there are different ways of living in God's divine will. And to uh, demonstrate this, Jesus gave Louisa her vision in volume 11, in which she saw various objects in different size that symbolize souls who live in God's divine will. He gave her an image of the sea and objects in the sea. Some were on the surface, some had penetrated the surface, and some had completely immersed themselves at the bottom of the ocean. And after having given Louisa this vision, he says to her, The sea symbolizes my immensity, while the objects, different in size, symbolize the souls who live in my will, but with different ways of living in it. Some live on the surface, others live just below the surface, and yet others completely lose themselves in my will, all varying according to how they live in my will. Some souls live in my will in an imperfect way, others in a more perfect way, and yet others reach the point of completely losing themselves in my will. Okay, so there you have it. Now, this comes, by the way, for those who would like to know where I'm quoting from. This passage comes from um, June 29th, 1914, volume 11. But if you want to be completely immersed in the divine will, you have to necessarily go through these three stages. Like John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and again, remember, God does not call us all to the same degree of holiness. So we can go through these three stages and not experience everything John and Teresa experienced. Remember the gifts that God gave John and Teresa, like rapture, ecstasy, are not part of spiritual marriage. They're not. They are gifts, endowments that God gives to them after they arrived at the state of spiritual marriage, which are not intrinsic to the gift of spiritual marriage. Many people don't realize this. The external gifts, the niceties, the consolations, the highs, are not part of spiritual marriage necessarily. Spiritual marriage is essentially union with God whereby the soul ceases to offend him deliberately. That's, in essence, what spiritual marriage is. All these niceties of ecstasy, transport, these are not essential to the state of spiritual marriage. On the contrary, you know what John of the Cross says? The heights of contemplation, the height of contemplation consists in spiritual aridity. These are his words. The height of contemplation is spiritual aridity. That means interior dryness. And this is buttressed in Louisa's writings as well, where Jesus tells her that the cross without delights gives God more glory than a person with delights, experiencing joys and consolations. And... Um, I don't know if I recall that passage in, in detail, but um, he says that prayer with consolation is like incense to me with smoke, whereas prayer without consolation but with dryness, aridity, desolation is like incense without smoke, and more pleasing to me. Because prayer without consolation exercises greater faith than prayer with consolation. And it's true. 
And for this reason, John of the Cross states that spiritual aridity, interior aridity, is the height of contemplation. Much like Adam, who was called to aspire to higher forms of holiness from the beginning, the baptized are called to aspire to higher forms of holiness and to grow through purification, illumination, and unification to a state of continuous prayer that Adam once enjoyed before sin. And to Louisa, Jesus reveals that the ability of the baptized to actualize by the grace of the Holy Spirit their latent potencies, which bring about, engender these spiritual sons, S-U-N-S, that God placed within the depths of Adam's soul, come about through our growth toward the divine will, under the action of the Holy Spirit who purges, illumines, and unifies. And the soul, as it progresses toward continuous prayer in God, is on a progressive journey throughout its pilgrim state. It never ends. So after baptism, the Holy Spirit invites the soul to partake intimately in the humanity of Christ, right? As the Catechism teaches us, quasi ex officio, which means it shares in the common priesthood that enables it to profess faith in Christ publicly and, as it were, officially, quasi ex officio, and to perform the threefold function of priest, prophet, and king. But it is not until the soul becomes more conformed to Christ through prayer, reception of the sacraments, growth in virtues, that it approaches the likeness of God, that original sin impaired. And this progression of the soul is found in the writings of the mystical doctors that I mentioned, who affirm that the soul matures in its spiritual journey by progressively traversing a series of stages, purgation, illumination, unification, which are known in theology as the human mode, the divine mode, and the continuous divine mode. So purgation is the human mode, illumination is the divine mode, and unification is the continuous divine mode. Now, with respect to the human and divine modes, Louisa affirms that the gift of living in the divine will elevates the soul to a continuous participation in God's own eternal mode of operation. Now, this is unique. Nowhere in the history of spiritual mystical literature, nowhere in the writings of all the doctors and mystical doctors and saints and fathers, Fathers of the Church, has anyone ever spoken of the soul participating in God's own eternal mode apart from the lives of Jesus and Mary? So Louisa is the first soul in the history of Christianity to affirm through God's inspiration and revelation that the soul conceived in sin can now partake of God's eternal mode of operation. Up until now, <clears throat> all the saints and doctors, including John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, spoke of human and divine modes. To Louisa, Jesus reveals that in this eternal mode of the divine model, which God, which constitutes God's single act, or one eternal point of God's operation, the divine will is continuously engaged in the human soul's finite activity. What's going on here, practically? Let's think about it. God absorbs and elevates the soul's actions, however menial they may be. Thinking, acting, praying, waking up, taking a step, its heartbeat, the circulation in its blood, any motion in its body or in its soul whereby it exerts an eternal, continuous, and simultaneous or concomitant influence in the lives and acts of every creature. 
Although in this eternal mode of prayer and action, which is eternally greater, or I should say surpasses eternally, the divine and human modes, the soul internalizes and impacts the lives of all creatures while offering God's sacrifices on their behalf. And the direct transforming effect of this impact in the lives of souls is determined by their free response. Basically, we can offer up to God on behalf of all creatures of the souls of the past, uh, the, uh, the souls of all creatures of the past, present, and future, all of our acts to increase their accidental glory to, if they're in heaven, to convert them, to dispose them, to open up their hearts to conversion to God, to save them from hell, to open up their minds to the grace of the knowledge of living in God's divine will by disposing events in their lives so that they come across people or materials revealing this information to them. Despite all this that we can do for these souls of all time, we cannot make them do anything. It's the graces that we give them are never lost. They're given to other souls if these souls refuse, certain souls refuse them. But each and every soul's free response determines the receptivity of these graces we obtain for them. And of course, we obtain these graces for them through our meditation on Jesus' passion, through our rounds throughout the created universe, through our morning offering and its renewal throughout the day, through our actual acts, our immediate acts, our unceasing prayer, the exercise of the virtues, the frequenting of the sacraments, and so forth. So Louisa basically sounds this distinctive note of God's eternal mode of the divine will, which has never been articulated before in Christian literature, and which the Holy Spirit actualizes in the soul. She describes this eternal mode as the continuous participation in the life of eternity, which John of the Cross calls the perfect state of glory that is proper to the next life, and that Adam and Eve enjoyed before sin. So Jesus tells Louisa, and I will share this excerpt with you, I'm sorry, the source of this excerpt with you after I quote it. My daughter, the blessed in heaven, give me much glory, because in the perfect union of their wills with mine, their life is a product of my will. There is so much harmony between us that their breath, inhalation, movements, joys, and all that which constitutes their beatitude is the effect of my will. However, I tell you that for the soul who is still on earth and united to my will in such a way that it never deviates from it, Its life is heavenly, and I receive from the soul the same glory I receive from the blessed in heaven. Or rather, I take more pleasure and delight in this pilgrim soul on earth, because what the blessed in heaven do, they do without sacrifice and amid delights, whereas what this pilgrim soul on earth does, it does with sacrifice and amid suffering. You see that? There's the interior aridity being the height of contemplation, giving God greater glory than prayer with consolation. And Jesus adds in this passage, wherever there is sacrifice, I take more pleasure and I am more delighted. Since the soul who is still a pilgrim and lives in my will forms one life with the blessed who live in my will, The blessed in heaven themselves participate in the pleasure I receive from this pilgrim soul on earth. Wow, that's powerful. We give God more glory if we live completely, see? That is, after we've traversed the stages of purification, illumination, unification. Or rather, we are traversing them concomitantly. We're in all three stages. We can give God more glory than the saints in heaven. Because we do it with sacrifice. Remember, the saints in heaven cannot merit anymore, nor the souls in purgatory. But we can. 
And we can increase their accidental glory, as did Luisa with Santa Aloysius de Gonzaga, as I shared with you in previous uh, segments. Now, where does this passage come from that I just quoted to you? It comes from uh, volume 7. Is that right? May 9th, 1907. Something is telling me that's not quite right. I'm looking at the footnote here because what I've done is I've um, referenced very quick. I didn't uh, go to the dissertation to actually pull up the actual source. Um, but I'm going to ensure that this is right. It uh, comes from, yes, that's correct. May 9th, 1907. And there are other excerpts he shares as well, and that is, um, I place the souls who live completely in my will on earth in the same condition as the blessed in heaven. Think of that. I place the souls who live completely in my will on earth in the same condition as the blessed in heaven. And that comes from volume 11, May 18th, 1915. He also tells Louisa in, in volume 5, December 6, 1904, I don't want the souls that have given themselves completely to my will on earth and that love me to wait to go to the beatific state when they go to heaven. I want it to begin on earth. I want to fill these souls not only with a heavenly bliss, but also with the bounty, the sufferings, and the virtue that my humanity possessed on earth. And that is why I divest them not only of material desires, see there's the purification, but also of the spiritual ones, that's the illumination, the unification, in order to fill them with my complete bounty and to give them the beginning of true beatitude. Isn't that beautiful? Well, that concludes this segment for today. There's much more I wanted to share with you, but that's enough for the hour. But let us remember that. If Jesus actualized in Louisa the gift of living in the divine will, he did not do so for her only or without having established within her these level stages of purification, illumination, unification. Why? Because she arrived at the complete possession of his will. Remember, there are different levels of living in the divine will. Once we enter the first stage of living, we impact all things of all time. We do not have to get to the last stage to do that. We do it right from the start. That's why Jesus tells Louisa, all you have to do is remove the pebble of your will and everything is done. But in order for us to penetrate these concentric rings and arrive at the center, completely possesses will, we must go through these three stages and arrive at spiritual marriage. And for this reason, Jesus reassures her that the gift of living in the divine will perfects all the other interior states. For where the other sanctities of mystical union end, the gift of living in the divine will begins. He moreover affirms that in wanting to make of her a more perfect image of himself and to actualize in her a new sanctity, he wishes to centralize in her all, all, all the interior states which have been up until now on the path of sanctity. And for this new sanctity, we must realize, it forms the crown and completion of all other sanctities. And that's why he tells her, my beloved daughter, wanting to make of you a more perfect image of myself and to actualize a new sanctity that is noble and divine and that constitutes the fiat voluntas tua on earth as it is in heaven, I want to centralize in you all the interior states which have been until now 
on the path of sanctity. He also, he also tells her, now where did that come from? That comes from, I don't want to get ahead of myself before concluding. It comes from volume 16, November 8th. November 8th, 1923. And to conclude, he also tells her, to live in my will is to enjoy, while remaining on earth, all the divine qualities. It is the sanctity not yet known, and that I will make known, which will set in place the last, most beautiful and brilliant ornament among all other sanctities, and that will be the crown and completion of all other sanctities. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I have one more quote <laughs> before giving you the blessing, and this comes from volume 16, November 5th, 1923. The sanctity of living in my will is a sanctity completely different from all other sanctities, except for the crosses, the mortifications, the necessary acts of life which done in my will embellish the soul more. The sanctity of living in my will is identical to the interior life of the blessed in heaven, who by virtue of living in my will enjoy within each of themselves my indwelling, as if I were there for each one alone alive and real, and not mystically, but dwelling really within them. Unquote. That's the real life of Christ in us, like the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. May God bless you and keep you in his will in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.